وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا This is the last ayah for today. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا Had they only had iman, and had they only had taqwa. Now interesting, Allah mentioned iman and taqwa. But the ayah before, how did they lose their iman and taqwa? What did they have that could give them their iman and taqwa? They had the book of Allah in their hands. They threw it behind their backs. Now Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَمَثُوبَةٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ the reward, the amazing, the incredible, the heavy reward that would have come especially from Allah would have been better. Had they only done that, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Had they only known. May Allah make us of those who do know. May Allah make us of those who are not of those, uh, of, of the unfortunate, who don't value the book of Allah and don't take guidance from it. May Allah give us a correct and sound understanding of His book and firm our faith from its learning. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَاتِ وَذِكْرِ الْحَكِيمُ السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَمَثُوبَةٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ثم أما بعد A couple of things I failed to mention that I think are important about the last ayah 103 that we were discussing in our conclusion وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا had they, only, had they been the ones had they only believed and أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا is repeating itself so Allah is pointing specifically to that group of people and saying they had the alternative they were in the position where they could have had iman. These are the people that were interested in sihr, if you recall. وَاتَّقَوْ And if they had iman, then the logical progression of having iman is taqwa. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is mentioning here a progress. And this is something that's come up before, how Allah mentions the progression in the life of a believer. So the first thing is iman, and then the progression of that is taqwa. So وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ But then the, the, the peculiar word that is used is لَمَثُوبَةٌ for sure, lam is lam of tawqeed, mathubah. Thawab is the word for reward. Thawab is a common word, many of you know that. The word mathubah is actually an ism maf'ul. And it's, it's the feminine form of the ism maf'ul. What it suggests is there's an adjective understood before, be it aqibah or jannah, or whatever that word may be. And what's interesting about the word mathubah, because it's feminine, in Arabic the feminine adjective is used for something that's plural. That's also possible, that a feminine adjective is used to describe that which is plural. Now what the word itself means is, that which has been given as a reward. That's mathuba, that which has been given as a reward. But since it's feminine, what is even alluded to in the text is, the reward would have been a lot of things. It wouldn't have been one thing. A lot of times our translations, because of the limitation that we have in language, will say the reward from Allah would have been better. لَمَثُوبَ تُمِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ but not capturing the beauty of the word mathuba here. That Allah is saying multitudes of rewards. And such rewards that they can't even be described with any description except that you will be compensated. The ism maf'ul has been given. Not the actual noun that is being described, subhanAllah. So this undescribable reward would have been given to them if they only met two conditions. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا If they, they, were just, they had to just meet these two conditions. Here what we're learning is a very important lesson. If someone has temptation in front of them of the impermissible, it's being dangled in front of them, because that's what was being done with them. Their final test was, that which Allah had forbidden, which Allah had made tantamount to kufr, was dangled in front of them. And they were told before they took it, لا تكفر don't, don't do kufr, you have the option not to do it. But they took it anyway. But what we're learning here is, if, if kufr is being dangled in front of you, if the opportunity to do the wrong is dangled in front of you, and you're still able to hold on to iman and to taqwa, the lazim and malzum together, then the reward is unimaginable. لَمَثُوبَةٌ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And then Allah Azza wa Jalla didn't say, لَمَثُوبَةٌ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَوْ مِنَ اللَّهِ He says, مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ This is, you know, the grammarian calls this مِنْ زَائِدَةٌ He calls it that it's extra, but the... From a Balaghi point of view, from a language point of view, there's nothing extra in the Qur'an. The unimaginable compensation that can't, that is especially from Allah. مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ 
Khair. And then the end, Allah just gives a simple comparison. Khair is actually a word used to give comparison between two things. What they got and what Allah had for, especially from Him, that can't even be described, is better. And so the final brief comment I want to make about this beautiful, beautiful ayah, لَمَثُوبَةٌ مِّنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ خَيْرٍ is not شرط, kalam shartī. It's not conditional speech. It's actually a jumla ismiya. It's just a statement of fact. The, the unimaginable compensation from Allah is better. So even though some translations will suggest, had they only had iman, the reward from Allah would have been better. Allah didn't say it would have been better. لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ It would have been better. No, no, no. خَيْرٍ It is better. <laughs> In other words, it's still there. If you're alive and you've made those mistakes, the door is still open. That, that reality is still there. لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Had those people only known. Had they only taken advantage of that. لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Now what's amazing is, that, that's the other riddle here. That the previous ayah, did they know this is kufr? Did they know that every, anybody who takes it, they will not have anything in the akhirah? Actually, Allah mentions in the ayah before, لَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَا نِشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ They already knew whoever takes it has no portion in the akhirah. Then how come the next ayah says, after you know, perfectly explaining and emphasizing, they knew already. The next ayah says, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Had they only known. Had they only known. We're learning two different degrees of knowledge. Knowledge in your head is not the same as knowledge in your heart. They're two different things. When somebody tells you, don't do this, it's haram, and you say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, and you do it anyway. Did you know? At some level you did know. But did you really know? Did you, did you, did you realize it in your heart? No, you didn't feel it. You didn't feel the value of it. So you know the same thing happens to a student. The exam is coming and his friend says, why don't you study? It's, you're running out of time. He says, I know, I know. He says, I know. And then when he sees the exam, he says, if I only knew. <laughs> you know the irony in speech? So now Allah says, had they only known, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ It's a very powerful means of, you know, of kalimat of hasr here. Right? لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَقُولُوا رَاعِنَا وَقُولُوا انظُرْنَا وَاسْمَعُوا وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Then Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, this was their, their old, you know, one of, one of the many crimes, a new crime is now being mentioned. And the believers are being warned. And this transition immediately, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Immediately, the, the kalam was about Bani Israel. All of a sudden, to Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, what are we being told? Pay attention. This is not just about them, so you just don't think about that it's about you. You have to stay alert. So the very next ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la taqulu ra'ina. Ra'a yura'i, it's from fa'ala yufa'ilu, mufa'ala. Okay? So mura'a'atan and ri'a'an, ri'a'a, like courtesy. Ra'ina is a fi'il amr, the ya gets dropped. So ra'ina means, the, the, Allah is telling the believers, those of you who claim to have iman, don't say ra'ina. Don't say, could you give us a minute? Could you give us some courtesy? Meaning the messenger says something, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and somebody wasn't quite paying attention, or they didn't hear it properly, or they were lost in their own conversation. So they say after he's done speaking, could you kind of repeat that please? Ra'ina. Now some members of Bani Israel, they used to actually extend the ya. Now ra'in in Arabic is a shepherd. And even though in Christian literature, shepherd is used in the sense of a leader, like I'm the shepherd of the town, shepherd of the household, right? So shepherd is in the position of leader. But in Arabian society in particular, Madani society, the shepherd is basically like the guy you hire for your lawn mowing nowadays. It's the guy who works for you. It's the guy that you're basically, if you call him by that name, you know, if you call him by the name of his profession, sometimes it's even a means to demean him. Hey janitor, come here. Right? When you call somebody a janitor, even if their job is a janitor, you should call them by their name. If you call them by their profession, it's like you're trying to insult them. That you're nothing but a janitor. So now if you say, instead of ra'ina, if you extend the ya, ra'ina, it becomes an ism fa'il. And it means, oh our shepherd. Meaning the guy who we hire to herd our sheep. Basically the equivalent today of a janitor. You know? So Bani Israel heard the, the sahaba say, ra'ina, please pay attention to us. And they would extend it and say, oh ra'ina, our shepherd. 
And then when you ask, would you say? They say, no, no, ra'ina. We meant, please give us a minute. So that they're playing with words. This is not something new for Bani Israel. Allah Azza wa mentions them playing with words even in Allah's book. So that's not something all that new. And you know, of course, there are other incidents like Assalamu alaykum, peace be upon you. Assalamu alaykum is basically a means of cursing someone if you drop the lamb altogether, which is a specific warning to desis. Assalamu alaykum. Assalamu <laughs> alaykum. Watch out. <laughs> Assalamu alaykum. Right? So in this case, ra'ina. So Allah commands His, his Sahaba, la taqulu ra'ina. Just don't say ra'ina. Just don't use that word. Even because it can be taken the wrong way, don't use it. Here we're learning something amazing about the manners of speech. Do you know even nowadays our youth, especially our youth, I mean, all, the, the, the senior citizens don't know much about the, the, the play of language in our time, at least in English. In, in Urdu or Arabi they might know, but in English they don't know as much. Are there words you can say in English that can have dual meaning? And have a really bad meaning too? But when you say, what'd you say? Ah, nothing. Or, you know, what the new game that's played is, I don't know, it's getting old now actually, it's, there's a really filthy word, and you say a word that's very close to it, we we'll just take a, we we'll change a little bit of the spelling, right? And then say, oh, I didn't say that, I just said this. Right? I just had the innocent version. I won't even give you as an example the innocent version. I think all the guys that know what I'm talking about and the sisters, they can already think of 20 words in their head that, that they, they manipulate, right? Now what Allah is teaching His Sahaba is don't play with speech because Allah knows the intent. And if you even use an innocent word, like ra'ina is an innocent word, but somebody else, it will conjure up in their minds bad ideas, avoid that kind of speech altogether. This is a very good principle in communication in life. Whether you're communicating with your spouse or your boss or your friends, if you say something that can be taken the wrong way, don't say it. If you have the common sense to know that if you say this, there's a way to interpret this that might be offensive. Just find another way of saying it. So Allah's mess- Allah, is told, Allah tells the, the Sahaba, وَقُولُ unzurna. Just say, please wait for us. Look towards us. unzurna. Could, could you please look this way? In other words, that's a polite way of saying, could you repeat that? Could you give me some attention, etc. Unzurna instead of saying ra'ina, which can be taken the wrong way. What a beautiful piece of advice. And so, because the Qur'an gave this subject importance, we shouldn't take it lightly. We shouldn't say playing with words here, that's not, what's the big deal? Just have a little fun with words. If it's a small deal, Allah would not mention it in His qawlan thaqilan, right? And the Qur'an calls its words heavy words. It's heavy speech. Allah would not reveal this from the seventh heaven to us if it was minuscule, if it was you know, something that could, you, you could get away with or do away with. It's not that important. It, it became important because Allah mentioned it. Because Allah talked about it. So, لا تَقُولُوا رَاعِنَا وَقُولُوا ظُرْنَا And then He says, وَاسْمَعُوا Really good advice also. <laughs> Why would someone say, could you please repeat that? Could you please, could you, could you say that again? Turn this way, give me extra time, give me extra time. Why would someone say that to begin with? Because they weren't listening the first time around. So Allah says, you know, the first time around, وَاسْمَعُوا And listen. Now what's interesting is in, the Quran, in Arabic, when you say listen carefully, the word for that is وَاسْتَمِعُوا Listen carefully. وَاسْمَعُوا So just, just listen. It's not listen carefully, it's just listen. You know what that suggests? You weren't paying even a little bit of attention the first time. So this time around, just at least listen. At least listen. وَاسْمَعُوا And then he ends the ayah because this is not just doing this with a teacher or a boss or a parent, not even those are important roles. This is being done with the Messenger wasallam. So even the least bit of disregard for the Messenger, what does Allah, what does Allah say to, coming to the defense of His Messenger? He says, وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And specifically for kafirin, for disbelievers and the ungrateful, there is incredible, you know, painful punishment. There is in, intensely painful punishment. عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ what is the crime of the kafir here? Is he attempting to kill the Messenger of Allah? No. Is he attempting to ins- you know, the, um, you know, change the book of Allah or any other of these kinds of crimes? No. He's just playing with words to make a mockery of the Messenger. And that's enough. وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ And so we'll end inshallah ta'ala with this ayah because this took some time. I was going to go one more ayah but inshallah ta'ala we'll, we'll, we'll take it easy and uh, cover مَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا tomorrow and even talk a little bit about the ayah of Naskh. That is not very well understood and it's also used or, or misused quite a bit nowadays when Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about some ayat being abrogated or mansukh, you know, how that, that even is being manipulated. So we'll discuss that tomorrow bi'idhillah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ما يود الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب ولا المشركين أن ينزل عليكم من خير من ربكم والله يختص برحمته من يشاء والله ذو الفضل العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم اما بعد اي نمبر 105 الله عز وجل makes a comment in regards to the attitude of what the what the there is an element within the people of the book what they really intend and there's an element within the mushrikun and he put their intent together The context of this ayah before I go into the translation and brief commentary is that there was an element among the the Muslim community in Medina especially those who had become Muslim recently among the Ansar because they had dealings with the Christians and Jews for their entire life and they were one of them for their entire life it was hard for them to imagine that the people they lived with their entire life would all of a sudden become their enemy and they would just have utter animosity towards them and so much spite towards them So there was an element within the Muslims even who thought, yeah, okay, we we believe in different things, but still they don't hate us or anything. And it's not like they don't, you know, they're out to destroy us or anything. That's a little extreme, you know. We shouldn't be paranoid about their attitude towards us. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal is revealing in this ayah something only he could know, the intent of the disbelievers. You want me to put that on? Sure. the the intent of a group within them and it's important to make a distinction that Allah Allah didn't speak of all the people of the book here and all the community in Medina he spoke specifically about a, a section within them and that's clear in the ayah itself so now let's look at the ayah Allah azza wa jalla says ma yawaddu alladhina kafaru min ahli alkitab those who committed the act of disbelief from out of the people of the book and from out of those and nor the mushrikeen so he didn't just say ma wa ma yawaddu ahlu alkitab he said ma yawaddu alladhina kafaru min ahli alkitab those who committed kufr those who committed disbelief from within the people of the book what we're learning here is there's an element within the people of the book that Allah has declared kafir they're the ones that have actually outright decided that they will not accept the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after knowing that he's true The truth has been revealed to them deep down inside they know it to be true. We read already in in these passages they changed the word of Allah even after they understood it. When a messenger came to them with something they already recognized after that they rejected it. Wa hum ya'lamun min ba'di ma aqaluhu they already know even after they understood it. These phrases have already come for them. So when someone knows the truth and then still denies it, then the Quranic term kafir applies. The two the two main places Where the word kafir or alladhina kafaru is used in the Qur'an, it's not used for all non-Muslims. Now the discussion of the fuqaha in their books and in their categorization is different than the way Qur'an labels people. The Qur'anic scheme is essentially, the word kafir is used in two situations essentially. One of them is in the case of the, of the one who understood the truth and, and knew it to be true deep down inside and rejected it anyway. Was not denied and rejected that truth. The other context in which the word kafir is used in the Quran is when someone picks up an arms against the Muslim. Someone goes out to try and kill and harm a Muslim, then the word kafir is used. These are the two main contexts in which alladhina kafaru occurs. So if you're speaking from the Quran's point of view, not everyone who's not Muslim would immediately we jump to the label kafir. Now that's not to say that they are also headed to paradise or they're also in the you know in in God's grace if you will etc etc that's not what i'm saying and we've had those discussions before we were already clarified the the concept of inna dinna inda allah al-islam that the acceptable deen with allah is in fact simply and exclusively islam and we talked about that in the ayah about the sabians and the the jews and the christians we had a long discussion about that but here it's important to understand there is a group within the people of the book that still has the potential to accept islam maybe they haven't thought about it enough yet maybe they haven't been totally exposed to it yet maybe they've heard it but it's somewhere in the back of their mind they haven't taken the time to really think about it maybe they're considering it but they have a goodness inside them they haven't decided that this is there's no way i'm accepting this they haven't closed the door but there's a group within them 
who not only have they closed their doors to this faith after understanding that it's true, but they've decided that they'll spend the rest of their life being an enemy to Allah's Messenger. These ayat are a comment about them. And they begin with the word of Nafi, the, the Adatul Nafi, Ma here. And Ma, as some of the Arabic students here know, is not just something that negates, but refutes. It's not, you know, La is the answer to a question. Do they want to harm us? Or, you know, do they wish us any good? They don't wish us any good. No. But if someone falsely believes they wish good for you, and you want to refute them, not answer their question, but refute them, prove them wrong, then ma is used. So the use of ma here suggests that there, an attitude was there that needed refuting. A belief was there, people were thinking the opposite of what the ayah is saying, and so Allah Azza wa Jal revealed a refutation of that concept. That's the benefit of the ma in the beginning of the ayah. مَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ The people who have disbelieved from among the people of the book, those who have disbelieved from among the people of the book, wouldn't want at all. They would not like this at all. مَا يَوَدُّ They would not like it at all. Get it through your heads. وَلَا الْمُشْرِكِينَ Nor the mushrikeen. Now the sahaba were clear that the mushrikun don't want any good for the Muslims. Their animosity was crystal clear. Nobody would doubt that they want no good for us. They've come to the point where even they've tried to execute the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's very clear. But in this ayah, Allah took a group of, from among the people of the book and the mushrikun who are clear-cut enemies, and He bunched them together and said, "Don't be naive. Understand that those kinds of vicious enemies you found in the Quraysh, that attitude even is among you here. There's a group within you here that has the same kind of animosity towards you. So what? How does this animosity? manifests itself, Maya what they don't they wouldn't want at all. Now what wouldn't they want? And Yunazala alaikum min khairim min rabbikum. That upon you especially any good at all would come from your master. They wouldn't want at all that anything good would come upon you from your master. Min rabbikum. So they wouldn't want first of all they wouldn't want victory for you. That's a good that comes from Allah. They wouldn't want rizq for you, That's, that comes from Allah. They wouldn't want you to be established in the land like Allah promised, لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ They wouldn't want the community in Medina to become strong. That's another khair that comes from Allah. But above and beyond all of that khair, the gift of risala, a messenger being given to this community. The gift of Allah's book, that's the ultimate khair that the people of the book actually know about. They wouldn't want that to come to you. They wouldn't, they, would, they wouldn't want to accept that. And this is why the previous ayah was talking about them undermining the statements of the messenger. Ra'ina and Ra'ina. They were undermining. Because they can't believe a messenger came to them. So they're going to try to undermine that. They can't stand that this, this good came to them. So, مَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يُنَزَّلَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ Any good at all. I mean, you got the ultimate good, but the word min here, adatu ta'ajjub it's called. Right? Any good whatsoever coming to you, they can't stand it. مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ From your master. And here we understand a universal principle. These two groups will always be there. There will be a category among the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. There will be a large category among the mushrikun who will just have spite against Muslims. They'll just hate them. And anything that, that seems like the, a remnant of good, a benefit that comes towards the Muslim, they can't stand it. They just can't tolerate it. Their anger will just flare up at the very sight of a Muslim. They'll just get upset. You know? So Allah Azza wa Jal responds at the end. He says, Wallahu yakhtassu. And it is Allah who specifies. It is Allah who, He specifies. You don't get to specify. He does. Bi rahmatihi. Especially by means of His mercy. Man yasha. He specifies especially by His mercy. Whoever He wants. Man yasha. He, that choosing of good didn't come from whether you hate it or like it, it's not going to change. The victory that has been written for the Muslims, the good that has been written for the Muslims, the guidance that has been declared that it will be revealed to them, the help from Allah that will come to them, no matter how much you hate it, وَلَوْ كَرِهَ mushrikun, It's going to happen. وَاللَّهُ يَخْتَصُّ بِرَحْمَتِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ And Allah is the possessor of the great favor. This is again, this is something that's come repeatedly in this surah, and we've alluded to this before, we talked about this before. Bani Israel were under the impression that the favor can only come to them. They have exclusive rights to the favor of Allah. Prophet after prophet after prophet, book after book. So now Allah is saying, what do you think? You own the favor that it comes only to you? The possessor of it is Allah. Wallahu dhul fadlil azim. The ultimate favor is in the possession of Allah. 
And now in this context, understand the next ayah quickly. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ We don't abrogate an ayah at all. Again, ma, adatul nafi. For refutation. So the, the idea was there, Allah would never negate. Allah would never negate any revelation. So one of, among the people of the book, there was an attitude, listen, our book was revealed from Allah. How can just, it wouldn't count anymore. That was revealed by Allah. Even you guys believe that. So now our response to their criticism is coming. Allah Azza wa is telling them, no, we wouldn't refute an ayah at all. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ Not a single ayah would we ever abrogate. Abrogation is a big SAT word, but cancel out. Right? Void the, the execution of the ayah. If there's a ruling in the ayah, if there's some kind of guidance or wisdom in the ayah that should be practically implemented, Allah may make it so that it becomes mansukh. In other words, a new revelation comes and that no longer applies. Now, just so you know, what was revealed to the people of the book, the Torah, the Injil, much of that is confirmed in the Qur'an. Much of our sharia that they cry about, a sharia law, is already in the Bible. And especially the things they can't stand, they talk about the rights of women, and they talk about women having to cover, all of that's in the Bible. That's not, I mean, our book just came to confirm what was already there. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ Right? It, or it just conf- came to confirm what's already there. So if they think it's, it's evil and, you know, it's vicious, like that guy with the funny mustache was saying on TV, right? Then, you know, th- these people, it's clear, being pastors, they even haven't read the Bible. <laughs> they don't have that kind of time, it's too much reading. Right? So, th- this idea that Qur'an came to confirm previous revelation, at the same time, there were things in previous revelation, that Allah Azza wa relieved us from. For example, Bani Israel was given Yom As-Sabt. They had to observe the Sabbath. Right? And this Ummah was given just the Friday prayer. Not even the whole day of Friday. You have to leave your business, not for the entire day of Saturday, not for the entire day of Friday, just the Friday prayer time. Then after that, فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضُ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Go spread out in the land and pursue Allah's favor. But sometimes Allah does bring something else and replaces the previous ruling. The previous law, the previous previous injunction. Now this happens from the previous revelation to this revelation, of course. So the Qur'an may, may do nasakh of much of the pre- previous revelations. Of course, much of them are lost. And even within that which remains, there may be things that Allah decides, that these are no longer laws that you have to re- be restricted by. But then He says, أَوْ نُنْسِهَا مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا Or we make it forgotten. أَنْسَى يُنْسِي إِنْسَى This is from Bab Ifal. Right, to make something forgotten. So two ways Allah Azza wa removes the revelation from among the people. One, He re- gives something else in its place. The other, He makes it forgotten. The Sahaba have narration about ayat that were completely made forgotten. But those ayat, are sub- they're subject to question. Why? Because if Allah made it forgotten, then nobody would remember. Nobody would remember. Because He made it forgotten. But if somebody says, I can remember, but I can't quite remember, well... <laughs> Insa is being put into question here, right? So, but the other way it's been understood traditionally by scholars is that there are previous revelations that just got completely lost. Their records, their documents, their original manuscripts, their memorization was just lost to the generations. So it got forgotten. Now Allah says, نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا We bring forward something better than what was forgotten or what which was abrogated. What is Allah telling Bani Israel directly? What Allah has revealed now is either just like what you have, نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا Either we bring something better, or we bring something just like it. We certainly don't bring something inferior to it. Or back, it's, always, it's only in forward, it's not in reverse. So what is coming down now is either better than what you already have, and as a mercy, life has been made easier for you. In Surah An-Nisa, we're going to learn, وَيُرِدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah intends to lighten your burden from you. You know, lighten your burden. The purpose of sharia is to, people are burdened, to take that burden off. In Ali Imran, we're gonna learn, كُلُّ الطَّعَامِ حِلًّا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تُنَزَلَ التَّوْرَاتِ All kinds of food was halal for Bani Israel, except for what Yaqub alayhi salam made haram upon himself. He didn't like certain kind of food, he made it haram upon himself. And Bani Israel later on, you know what they did? Oh, it's haram. Allah is saying, فَأْتُوا بِالتَّوْرَاتِ فَتْلُوهَا Go, you know, don't even bring Qur'an, bring Tawrat and read it. Show me where is it, where, where is it, this kind of food haram. Please show it to me. Allah challenges them to bring Tawrat. 
Right? So now Allah is, is telling us this in, in this surah, in this ayah, He's telling us this revelation that has come is superior. Or just like what you already have in its original form. There's no reason for you to be complaining about it. نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ This is a very important part of the ayah too. Didn't you already know that Allah is capable over any and everything? In other words, the complete authority on this issue of what revelation should come and shouldn't come is in whose hands? It's in Allah's hands. Who are you to say, why did this come? Why did that got can- get cancelled? Why did this apply? Why doesn't that apply? Who are you? In the, didn't you already know Allah? You've already said, in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. That statement, in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, is not new for Muslims. This is something taught to all the prophets. You didn't know that already? And if you knew that, how dare you question the, the, the wisdom and revelation? The authority of revelation. Where do you get, get off questioning it like this? Now the final comment about this I'll make, and I'll conclude about this ayah. It's a very famous ayah, an important ayah in, in Ulum al-Qur'an about the, the subject of naskh, which is a deep subject and a, it's a difficult subject to study in the study of the Qur'an. The concept of abrogation of the Qur'an from within. And scholars have categorized it, you know, a hadith being abrogated by the Qur'an, ayat of Qur'an being abrogated by the Qur'an, and so on and so forth. They have different sections and, and sort of categories. But you know, the sincere ulama of our ummah, our, our traditional scholars, their efforts have always been to minimize which ayat should be considered mansuh, which ayat should be considered no longer applicable, or other ayat came in their place and you don't take guidance from them or instructions from them. They will try to minimize the count. Why? Because if you're going to say something about the words of Allah, you're going to take, talk about an ayah and say, oh, this ayah doesn't count. This ayah doesn't apply. This other ayah came, cancel this one out. So we don't take a ruling from this ayah. Before you talk about the word of Allah like that, you better be a hundred, what, two hundred percent sure. Because you're not just canceling out your words or my words. You're not just, you know, making irrelevant some casual speech. This is the speech of Allah that was revealed from the heavens to the earth, to the final messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is not a small matter, you know. So great scholars of our deen, their efforts would be to reduce and reduce and reduce, like a suyuti rahimahullah reduced it to like 14 ayat. Then Shah Waliullah Dahlvi rahimahullah in Hujjatullah al baligh reduced it to like 5 ayat. That 5 ayat maybe count under Nasikh al Mansukh. Others said, no, even those 5 ayat can be understood in a way that you don't consider them completely Nasikh you know, or, or Mansukh. In other words, the efforts of the ulama were to not jump the gun to every time they see an, uh, an ayah or you know, a hadith, oh, Mansukh. That, that's a sick attitude. But you know what's happened in our time? Out of the anger, on the one hand there's anger that drives misguidance, and on the other hand it's fear. There are Muslims that are afraid of what the Qur'an says, hey, it might sound politically incorrect. So you know what they'll say? Oh, these ayat are mansuh. They don't apply. That, that context died. So he said for practical purposes, even if they won't use the word, they're just saying it is mansuh. On the other hand, you'll have people that are very angry. And so they'll memorize Surah Al-Tawbah and Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Ahzab and all the surahs that have battles in them. And when somebody talks about da'wah or sabr or patience or perseverance, they'll say, no, 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 no. Those are all Makki surahs. When Madani Qur'an came, all the Makkan Qur'an became mansukh. All the ayat about sabr and being patient and dealing with your enemy as though they're your friend, all of this is mansukh. Even the ayah, لا إكراها في الدين There's no compulsion forcing someone into the religion. That's mansukh too. It's all good. Mansukh everything. Two-thirds of the Qur'an is Makkan. Two-thirds of the Qur'an is Makki. And a significant chunk of the Madani Qur'an is talking about da'wah too. But they say, no, 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 the ayat of qital have come. So all of those ayat, they're just, they're done. And you know what this attitude does? It's not only a statement about the Qur'an, it's also a statement about the seerah. That all, that early part of the seerah, you don't need any guidance from that. That's all done with, that's just an interesting history. The real seerah, where we take guidance from is Madani seerah. Like Makkah seerah almost doesn't even count. You know, this is a very, first of all, it's, it's unfair to our deen. Second of all, it's unfair to this, the beautiful seerah of our Messenger wasallam, And it's unfair to the Qur'an, it's unfair to Allah's book. Why would he reveal to us something, the majority of which is <laughs> mansuh? Why would he do that? That doesn't make any sense. So this, this reading of the seerah, it's actually driven by anger. It's driven by, I want to justify what I want to do. And if I start, read something in the Qur'an that doesn't agree with what I want to do, I'll just call it mansuh. 
It's a sick attitude that's developed. Subhanallah. And the original context of the ayah, study where the ayah is, the textual context of the ayah, the discussion is entirely pretty much about previous revelations. And then being mansukh by the coming, coming of the Qur'an. The good being, good coming to the believe, to the believers, and an element from the people of the book and the mushrikun can't stand that the good keeps on coming. And the, you know, you know I, I finished that ayah, but I two comments about that. You know why the mushrikun couldn't stand it? Because the ayat kept coming and they didn't have a response. They send their Walid ibn Mughira, he doesn't have an answer. They send their best poets, they get stumped. They try to accuse it of being magic or sorcery or just, you know, mumbo jumbo. They try to give it all kinds of allegations. None of them stick. People know better. So they can't stand it that it keeps coming. It keeps reinforcing the truth in the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. You know why the people of the book can't stand it? Because every time the Qur'an comes, it basically opens up another skeleton from their closet. Allah tells them something else they did. You know when you did this? You know when we sent you clouds? You know when we sent you, we, we, we give you 12 springs of water? You know when we, Now they don't like to talk about all their mistakes in the past. Nobody likes to talk about their mistakes. You know when you, your boss calls you into the office, in his office, and starts listing all the days you came late? <laughs> Right? And all the assignments you didn't hand in on time, and all the complaints that are about you from the other co-workers, you just want it to end. You can't stand listening to the complaints. Allah Azza wa Jalla has the entire record, and what, what, in, in this surah, what's He doing to the people of the book? What after? You did this, and then you did this, and then you did this, and then you did it, and you're gonna talk now? Now you're gonna talk? Look at how He exposed them with Musa alayhi salam. You know? Allah Azza wa Jalla even says, I told you, Hold on to the book I've given you with great strength and then سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا We hear and we disobey. You said that to Allah directly? You remember that? So it's humiliating. So every time the revelation comes, they get even more irked, more irritated. And now Allah is teaching them, this revelation has come, this is like what you had, and even better. That's the original context of the ayah of Nas. May Allah Azza wa Jal help us appreciate the ayat of the Qur'an and get guidance and benefit from them and make them a means for a reminder for ourselves and our families. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألم تعلم أن الله له ملك السماوات والأرض وما لكم من دون الله من ولي ولا نصير أم تريدون أن تسألوا رسولكم كما سئل موسى من قبل ومن يتبدل الكفر بالإيمان فقد ضل فقد ضل سواء السبيل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ثم أما بعد we're at ayah number 107 of سورة البقرة the last ayah as we talked about was the ayah about Nasikh and Mansukh, the revelation, the previous revelations being Mansukh, and sometimes even in or, an order of the Qur'an being Mansukh. And we had a bit of a conversation about that. And now Allah Azza wa Jal is putting the one who questions the idea of Mansukh in their place. And he says, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Didn't you already know that Allah, to, to Allah alone belongs the, the dominion of the skies and the earth, وَمَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ And you will not find anyone other than Allah of any nature of a wali, any kind of protective friend, anyone that has even the will to protect you the way Allah does, وَلَا نَصِيرٍ nor any helper. Now the word helper is kind of an oversimplified translation of nasir. Uh, nasir once again is some sifa, which means that it's, it's a permanent quality. Allah is always there with His help. And it comes from the word nusra or nasr which actually means to help against oppression. So when Allah says, مَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ On the one hand, by use of the word wali, he's offering his permanent protection. And on the other, he's helping his help against oppression. His help against oppression, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then once he offers this, the, the, the idea behind that is, you know, the, uh, you know, the Bani Israel that were refusing to accept the message, there were two issues. They, and they were feeling pressure, if we accept this, then we'll be ostracized from our community. Because it's not the entire community that's going to accept all at once. It's going to be fardan fardan, you know, one at a time. So if one person accepts, they're going to be ostracized by their, their peers. I actually happen to know, this is back in like 99, 
a good friend of mine in college who was actually uh, studying to become a rabbi. And in his studies, he became Muslim. While his studies had become Muslim. But he kept it quiet. Like he continued his rabbinical studies and went and became sort of, and all that. Why? Because he was terrified to death to expose the fact that he's no longer you know, a member of that. Because, you know, you know, they're going to kick me out. They're going to do all kinds of things against me. I know they're going to, they could get away with all kinds of things. He used to be like paranoid about it. Subhanallah. So, you know, there, that, that pressure is real. I know a brother similarly who used to be uh, Agha Khani, Ismaili. Right, so when he, he decided to become Muslim. Actually, he used to own a, a bookstore uh, for Muslims. Like an Islamic bookstore. We used to sell like Ahl Sunnah kind of books. So he started reading a couple of them because he had a lot of free time apparently, not that many sales, you know. So he starts reading them and he becomes Muslim. And when he became Muslim, he gave da'wah to his own wife and children. They became Muslim. But, and when his tribe found out, my goodness, they, they made the guy's life miserable. They would call the cops on him randomly. They, you know, got him kicked out of his job. He literally had to move, change his name, all kinds of stuff. So the idea is when you have a very tight-knit community and somebody pulls back, last story I'll tell you just came in my head. Sister I met in, uh, in Alabama, actually, and in Louisiana. Uh, she had taken shahada in a small town outside of Mobile, Alabama. It's considered a small town compared to Mobile. So you can imagine how that works, right? So it's like population 400 or something. One major church in the town. She's the daughter of the, pre the preacher, and she, she became Muslim because of dreams she saw of the Kaaba. It's like ridiculous. And she was attending a seminar in, in New Orleans when I was teaching a seminar there, right? She hid it from her parents, started wearing hijab, somebody noticed, started calling her a heathen, a devil worshiper, all kinds of names. To get answers, she drove two hours over to the closest masjid she could find on Google where they yelled at her for entering the masjid because she's a woman. So she left again and decided maybe this is not the right religion. Maybe I was just, maybe that was the devil. Saw the dream again about the Kaaba. <laughs> it came back to another masjid. Subhanallah, what an amazing journey. But the kind of, you know, her parents were paying her tuition. She was going, she's a smart student. Now they basically they've kicked, out her, kicked her out of the house. And, you know, she lives in the college now. She's a smart, intelligent student, so she's, you know, a, a, on a scholarship. But there is this idea that you'll lose your wilaya and you'll lose your nusra. When you come towards this deen and you realize that, that that revelation has now been replaced by this one, then there will be those who will completely cut you off. So Allah is telling you, no. مَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ You're not going to find other than Allah any wali, any helper. Any helper against such oppression. And then he asks, he's speaking to another group. And this, this was at the individual level, alam ta'lam, and now in the plural. You know, Allah Azza wa Jal asked this really tough question. أَمْ تُرِدُونَ أَن تَسْأَلُوا رَسُولَكُمْ or is it the case that you intend to question your messenger? The idea of nasikh and mansukh is that of questioning Allah. Why did Allah send this? Then He sent something else. What's going on here? It would be the idea of questioning Allah. But now in this ayah, Allah says, "Am turiduna an tasalu? Not Allah. An tasalullah. No, an tasalu Rasulakum. Are you intending to question your messenger? And interestingly enough, He didn't even say an tasalu Rasulullah. Are you intending to question the Messenger of Allah? He didn't even say that. He said, your Messenger. In other words, this was a gift. He was a gift sent to you. And you're going to question him? What are you doing? And here, an important distinction. Asking the Messenger versus questioning the Messenger. These are two different things. The deen actually, you know, it encourages people to ask. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ Ask the people, who are the people of remembrance. You know, ask. Sell Bani Israel. Ask Bani Israel how many ni'am they were given. The question of asking is not the problem. But when you question, there's a difference between asking a question and questioning a person. When you question a messenger, what are you doing? You're questioning the legitimacy of their claims. When you're asking, you're asking, I don't understand something, can you help me understand? I'd like to understand it so I can apply it better. I'm not questioning its legitimacy, I'm just trying to understand. That's okay. It's, you're encouraged to ask, especially as a student of knowledge, you know, as some of our students learn, as su'al nisful ilm, right? Asking is half of knowledge, right? So that's encouraged. But on the other hand, the tone of your question, the intent of your question, the attitude of your question. If somebody comes and says, I want to understand how zakat works, you know, you know how do you calculate the two and a half percent? That's asking, that's fine. 
Somebody asks and says, Why is, what's, what's the point of two and a half? I don't get it. I don't even see the sense in that. And why can't I pay one and a half? You know? Can I pay you know, one this year and two and a half next year and make it up or whatever? Because I don't see the logical point. Now that's not asking, that's questioning. Allah Azza wa Jal here is talking to Bani Israel who kept on questioning. How come you want us to throw a piece of flesh on this, this corpse? What, why, do you, why do you want us to slaughter a cow? Questioning. You know one of the famous hadith of the Messenger والسلام, one piece of it, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْضَى لَكُمْ ثَلَاثًا وَيَكْرَهُ لَكُمْ ثَلَاثًا Allah loves three things for you, He, desp- he despises three things for you. One of those three things, كَثْرَةُ sual. Asking too many questions. Meaning questioning the legitimacy of things. And you know when somebody asks too many questions, this is easily relatable, until you get the answer you really had already in your head, in your heart. So somebody, is this, is, you go to somebody and say, is this haram really? And he says, yes. The imam says, yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Then you go to somebody else. Is, same question, is this haram really? He says, yes to you. He says, okay, I gotta keep asking then. You keep going until you find someone who makes it halal for you. And you say, oh, you know what, I looked it up, it's halal. You know, I asked someone. You asked a lot of people, but you didn't stop until you got the answer you wanted. In other words, you know, there's one thing, you already have the conclusion inside you, you're just trying to legitimize the filth that's already inside. And there's the, it's something completely different when you say whatever Allah and His Messenger say, whatever the ulama have come to understand that know a lot better than I do, I'm willing to trust that and move on. You know, that's one thing. But in the end, if you just, in the end, you just want to follow what you want to do. And until you get the answer that is in line with your own personal preference, then that's a disease. So, أَمْ تُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَسْأَلُوا رَسُولَكُمْ كَمَا سُئِلَ مُوسَى مِنْ قَبْلِ The way Musa was asked much before you, are you going to do the same thing Musa was, you know, Musa was done to? And the other thing interesting is, the words used in the Qur'an by Musa alayhi salam is, لِمَا تُؤْذُونَنِي He didn't even say, لِمَا تَسْأَلُونَنِي He didn't, when he turned to Bani Israel, he didn't say, why do you ask me so many questions? He said, why do you cause me pain? <laughs> His words are, why do you cause me pain? This is a means of, you know, aggravating and causing pain to Allah's messengers, alayhim salatu wasalam. So learn from this example. And here, again, the other thing we learn is, the entire conversation was about Bani Israel, and all of a sudden Allah says, you want to question your messenger? Like Musa was questioned. And the other thing here, the final thing about this ayah that's really beautiful, is Bani Israel is being told, this is your messenger too. أَمْ تُرِدُونَ أَن تَسْأَلُوا رَسُولَكُمْ كَمَا سُئِلَ مُوسَى مِنْ قَبْلِ This is not the Rasul of the Arabs and you have your own messenger. This is your messenger also. Don't think of him as some, as some other messenger because their basis for rejection was he's a Gentile. He's not from the chosen nation, from the sons of Ishaq. You know, he's from the sons of Ismail. So that we can't accept him. But no, he's your messenger. كَمَا سُئِلَ مُوسَى مِنْ قَبْلِ وَمَنْ يَتَبَدَّلِ الْكُفْرَ بِالْإِيمَانِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ And whoever replaces their faith, iman, with kufr, with disbelief. Several beautiful things in that, inside this statement. One questioning a messenger is equal to what? It's equal to kufr. Just questioning the legitimacy of something the messenger teaches is equal to kufr. Because the messenger is not speaking on his own behalf. He's speaking on Allah's behalf. Questioning Allah and questioning a messenger, the, the, the questioning legitim- legitimacy of either is one and the same thing. It's the same root problem. So it's kufr. And here the other thing is being reinforced. In, in many faith traditions today, messengers are being undermined. Belief in God is the most important thing. Messengers, you know, we can all believe in different messengers, that's okay. But we're on well, all one big family, happy family under God. Children of God, these, these kinds of phrases are being used, right? Undermining the legitimacy of messengers. Because kufr would not be kufr in a messenger. Kufr really means kufr in Allah Azza wa No, Allah says no. Whoever replaces their kufr with you know, their iman with kufr by questioning a messenger, فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ Then he's gone way off the, the even path. He's really been misled off of the straight path. If he takes up this attitude. So we have to check our attitude in regards to how we speak about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The final just point to think about for all of us, including myself, is that, you know, these ayat are speaking to sahaba, they're speaking to members of Bani Israel in Medina, but they're also speaking to us today. Yes, the Messenger والسلام, is not among us today. We don't get to interact with him and speak with him. But what is among us today? What is among us today is the understanding of his sunnah. To us, the Messenger is like a constitution. He's encapsulated in books like the Bukhari and the Muslim and the books of Sirah, right? And books of Tafsir. He's encapsulated in these volumes of literature. That's how we get to know our Messenger by this knowledge that has been passed down. 
So what somebody would do back in the day when they heard something coming from the messenger and they would ridicule it and you know, make a mockery of it and, and you know, minim, you know, think of it as something minuscule, this would be considered tantamount to kufr back in the day. But today, if it's not him directly, it's his words. It's his hadith, it's his sunnah. And so there are two things here. There's one, there's the hijacking of the sunnah. It's important to mention this in a brief comment. You, something for you to think about. No, no, no sharh of the hadith, no analysis of the hadith, no knowledge of who was, who was the hadith speaking to, who was the listener, how did they understand it, how did they implement it, nothing. Just read the translation from a copy you picked up on your own or Google the translation of a hadith and then shove it down somebody's throat and say, hey, this is the sunnah. Why don't you obey it then? What are you, munafiq? You know, this is, this is also hijacking the sunnah, by the way. But when somebody presents, especially ulama of our deen, because you know, the study of sunnah and the study of fiqh is not something like, you know, it's not something basic. You know, I, I don't have the capacity to study it. If I have a hadith question, I go to a alim and I say, please help me understand this hadith. Because I don't know the full story behind, you know, the entire shar, how it's been understood, how it's been analyzed, what other factors are involved. But once a scholarly position has been presented, thoroughly presented, or you know that somebody, for example, I'll give you a basic, basic example to conclude. Somebody has something like a beard. And you think, you know, the beard looks funny or something. You know, and people make comments about that. People in your family may make comments about it. Right? Your, 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 you know, your friends, your cousins, or old friends back in the day who knew you back when you were a lot smoother, you know. <laughs> they look at you and say, what's going on? You know, is there a new, new trend? Or you join a, joining a biker gang? Or... You know, what's with the mountain goat? Look, I've heard all kinds of things, right? So they'll poke fun of the beard. Or they might poke fun of a hijab. Or they might poke fun of, you know, whatever. Somebody's doing miswak, they may, may poke fun of it. Now whether you agree with that position in the sunnah or not, is that person doing it because they believe it to be from the sunnah? Yes. So poking fun of that is the same as what? Who are you actually poking fun of? Who are they, who are they mimicking? The person who's growing their beard, who are they trying to copy? Whether you agree with what they're doing or not, whether your understanding is different or not, they're doing it in love of Allah's Messenger wasallam. At least we should have respect for that love. At least that much. Even if you're not, you're not the one who's following it. At least you know where it comes from. That opinion does exist. So respect it. Don't open your mouth about it. If you have nothing good to say about someone practicing the deen, at least don't make fun of it. Don't make fun of it. Because you don't know how it's going to be counted against us. It may not be taken as something trivial. I was just kidding. You know, they're, they're, I mean, they're, and I, I specifically decided to mention the beard because among brothers, you know, younger brothers, they kind of crack jokes among each other and things get out of hand very quickly. Especially with guys that can't grow a good beard, you know, they've got patchwork going on. So they get a lot of commentary, you know. So you have Sahaba even in, in Sahaba, some couldn't grow their beards. They like had one hair, you know. They're, 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 we have people in our history like that, recent scholars. They're, I was uh, listening to an interesting lecture and you know, now he's being painted as this demon or whatever. I won't even mention a name. But somebody said, oh, he didn't have a beard. That's why he's not a good scholar. The guy couldn't grow a beard. He had like one hair. You could never see it. If you, tip, if you zoom in on the photo, you'll see a hair. And it was really long one hair too. <laughs> right? What do you mean you couldn't grow a beard? I mean, how dare you talk about somebody like that? So we have to have, I mean, none of these things would be there if we had ukhuwa and brotherhood and love towards each other and a fear of Allah. And a respect for the sunnah of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, the sahaba wouldn't laugh at, a, you know, at other sahaba for doing what they did. You know, and it, again, I'm not saying that differences in fiqh aren't possible, they are. But they should be respected. Because they all in the end trace back to the sunnah in one way or the other. And that's how Allah will judge us. So may Allah Azza wa Jal make us respectful towards each other and not make us of those who in any way, shape or form question the integrity of the Messenger or what the Messenger brought sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah protect all of our iman. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani afqahu qawli. Walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man walah. The intent, the want of many from among the people of the book who would like to see nothing more than us return back. Many from the people of the book would do, they would really want that hopefully you would turn away after you have iman back into 
being disbelievers. Because of what? Hasadam min indi anfusihim. Out of a jealousy that, that emanates from within themselves. Min ba'di ma tabayyan alahum al haqq. Even after the truth has been clarified to them, fa'fu wasfahu. Then continually pardon and turn the page. Afu in Arabic is loving forgiveness. In other words, your attitude should remain soft towards them no matter how much hate they show towards you. This is a madani ayah. The ayat of qital are coming against the mushrikun, but a different fault foreign policy is being talked about with people of the book. With the people of the book at this time, what should you maintain? Fa'fu wasfahu. With the Christians and the Jews, pardon them lovingly, no, even if they say hateful things, and keep turning the page, in other words, overlooking. In, uh, I think in Punjabi there is the expression, mitti pao, right? Mitti pao. When you turn the page, I, I think the, in English they say, bury the hatchet. Don't let, let bygones be bygones, if you will, right? So, fa'fu wasfahu. Until hatta ya'ti Allahu bi amrihi, until Allah comes with His decision, meaning until a new policy is revealed on how to deal with them, this is how you should deal with them. Even if they express this kind of hatred and they want you to leave your deen out of jealousy. This jealousy that's being talked about, first of all, it's alluding to the fact that a, a message has came, come to someone other than Bani Israel. Right? Why isn't it one of ours that received a message? And how come this message keeps getting stronger and stronger? And how come they keep get, gaining more and more support? So, hasada min indi anfusihim. Anyhow, Allah says, "Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir." No doubt, it is Allah that's in complete control over all things. In other words, their hatred, their jealousy—it's not going to cause you any harm. Everything's still in Allah's control. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Wa aqimu al-salat wa atu al-zakat wa ma tuqadimu li anfusikum min khayr tajduhu 'ind Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ And this, this, the, the ayah after it is really incredibly connected. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ You've heard this many times before. Establish the prayer and give zakah. وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ And whatever you send forward, whatever you invest in for yourselves, out of good deeds. قَدَّمَ in Arabic, to put something, something ahead. So whatever you send ahead, meaning, you know how you say you're making an advanced deposit? You put something for future periods, future time. In Arabic they say, I'm putting it ahead. Meaning I'm not going to use it right now, I'll use it later when I get there. So time is given the image of travel. When I get, you know, when I get ahead in terms of time. So when we spend for the sake of Allah, and we do good things, we're depositing rewards ahead. When we get before Allah, then we reap those rewards. So he says, وَمَا تُقَدِّبُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ Whatever investment you make for yourself, for the future, of any good deed at all, the big, the two big good deeds he mentioned, which is aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Those are the two main ones. But then he says, whatever else you do. What does he say about them? Tajiduhu عند Allah. You will find them with Allah. They're not going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. The question though is, what does this have to do with the Ahlul Kitab having hatred towards us and that they would want us to turn into kuffar? Right after that Allah says, aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Wa ma tuqaddimu li anfusikum min khayrin. Tajiduhu عند Allah. Why? Why this focus on our deeds? You know what happens a lot of times? I've even met Muslims. There's a very common attitude among Muslims today. Oh, they're out to get us. You know what they're doing? You know what they're planning? You know, I met this brother one time after a dars I gave, and he's like, you know, they're building concentration tech camps for Muslims in Texas. I have, I've, I've been collecting YouTube videos and other documents, and I have a lot of proof. I'm like, brother, even if that's true, what are you going to do about it? We have to prepare. Prepare how? I don't know, but we have to do something. We have to tell people. Tell people what? What are you going to do? All we, we become so obsessed with conspiracy theory and how they're, you know, they're going to take over the world and all of this stuff. You know what we lose sight of? The good deeds we're supposed to really invest in. No matter what anybody else does, they cannot bring us any harm except if Allah wills. And so a lot of times we become so obsessed with what the kuffar are doing against Islam that we even forget what we're supposed to do ourselves. Allah says, don't lose your priorities. أَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ آتُوا الزَّكَاءِ مَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِي أَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ Allah is in full view of what they're doing, but now He says Allah is in full view especially of what you're doing. First He told us their activities and what's going on inside their hearts. They have hasad inside their hearts. We cannot see inside their heart. Allah looked inside their heart and told us they have hasad. Allah told us what their intentions are even if they didn't spell them out to us. 
But Allah says, I'm not, he, he's, even though He sees all of that, He lets us know that what is He watching carefully? What we're gonna do. What good deeds are we obsessed with? SubhanAllah. It's just that don't lose sight of priorities. Don't lose sight of what you're really on this earth for. وَقَالُوا لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا See now, when it comes about, you're gonna get your rewards where? In Jannah. When that discussion reaches them, they say, no, 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 you're not getting the Jannah. You guys, Muslims, no, you guys, not. nowadays they call us devil worshippers and all kinds of fun names they gave us, right? Before they, in old high school textbooks in America, like in New York, when I used to go to high school, I came straight from the Muslim world to go to high school in New York, and our textbook, World Religions, under, under Global Studies, Muslims worship the moon god. Right, so we used to be moon worshippers, now we're devil worshippers, they keep changing every few seasons. Eventually they'll realize, you know, but let them try all the other options out first, for us. But anyhow, Allah Azza wa when this reward reaches them, that Allah is giving us the promise of paradise, they come out boasting and they say, and they still say to this day, وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ No, 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 no one's gonna enter paradise. إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَصَارًا Except for the one who's either Jewish or Christian. Which is interesting, because this statement was not being made by a great many of them. This was either Hudan or Nasara, by the way. Allah is combining two statements. The way it's understood by scholars is the Christians said, only Christians will enter paradise. The Jews said, only Jews will enter paradise. And this will become clearer later on when the ayah comes, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودِ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودِ عَلَى شَيْءٍ The Christians say, the Jews stand on nothing. And the Jews say, the Christians stand on nothing. Right? And Allah didn't refute either of them because they're both right. So, you know, they... So it's the interesting nuance in the ayah. But anyhow, here Allah Azza wa Jalla says, لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًى أَوْ نَصَارًا No one will enter paradise except for the one who's either Jew or Christian. What's incredible is to this day, one of the things they talk about that is intolerant about Islam, is they'll come to Muslims and say, do you believe only Muslims will enter paradise? Do you believe Christians can go to heaven too? And the Muslim will say, well, I don't know about you personally, but whoever does shirk in Allah, shirk is an unforgivable crime. And whoever you know knows about his messenger and still disbelieves, that's pretty strong. So I'm not judging a person, but the act of shirk, Allah has passed a verdict, it's not my verdict. Just you guys are such an intolerant religion. You believe others are going to hell. You ever talk to a pastor about who's going to hell? You ever talk to anybody, any of them about who's going to have success in the afterlife? They're very exclusive in their religions. They don't believe Muslims are going to paradise. Ask a, 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 your Christian friend who thinks Islam is intolerant, what do you think Muslim, where, where do you think Muslims are going? What are they going to tell you? They'll tell you flat to your face. They will tell you flat to your face. The only time I didn't get a straight answer, I was talking to a rabbi one time. What do you think? Muslims, paradise? What do you think? Well, I don't know. The concept of paradise a little, you know, because they, they've even watered down the concept of paradise. Many, many denominations among them. Yet many others do still believe in a concept of paradise. Now this is not to say that we should have a spiteful attitude towards them. Because the ayah before even mentioned lovingly pardoning them. Fa'fu. That's even when they have hateful attitudes towards us. Nowadays a lot of Muslims have spiteful attitudes towards Jews and Christians. Even if they haven't said anything to us. We just see a non-Muslim and we're like, eh. عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءَ بَيْنَهُمْ That's about the only Qur'an we know. Right? Intense, severe against the kuffar, merciful against towards each other. Even though, let's be honest, we're not even merciful to each other. We're just mean all around, right? But what, what, the point I'm trying to get across though is, our attitude towards Christians and Jews has to be the best attitude. You know where fa'fu wasfahu is used in the Qur'an? It's used when you're dealing with your wife, with your family. That's where these words are used. Now they're being used for people of the book. We have to have really excellent dealings with them. Because if this book is true, the proof of this will not come from arguments, it will come from our character, our dealings with them. The most effective tool in Christian preaching missionary work is not the Bible. You know what it is? Their behavior, their character, their humanitarian efforts, them going to villages and helping out and providing medical services and this and that and the other. Their character. That's what appeals to people. The first thing that turns people off from Islam, you know what it is? It's not the Qur'an. It's the behavior of Muslims. It's the attitude of Muslims. It's the work ethic of Muslims. It's how we leave our bathrooms in the office after we make wudu. It's how we park our cars in front of their lawns on Jum'ah. It's the behavior of Muslims. It turns them off. You know? Why would they even be interested? What, I mean, if that's their behavior, obviously they're getting this from somewhere. They think they're getting this from Islam. Our misbehavior is an insult to Islam itself. That's what it is to them. That's how they see it. This is who we are. SubhanAllah. 
So here Allah Azza wa Jal gives this attitude of theirs. Nobody's entering paradise except the Jew and the Christian. Tilka amaniyuhum. These are their wishful thoughts. In other words, these flim, these these whimsical thoughts are not based on any research they did or any study. This is what they were raised with. They never questioned it, and they're holding on to it. This is what amani is: wishful thinking, not based on any knowledge. Qul hatu burhanakum. Then ask them the toughest question of all: hatu burhanakum. Bring your undeniable proof. Go ahead. I'd like to see your evidence that you're the only ones going to paradise. In kuntum sadiqin, if in fact you're truthful. In other words. This, there are two challenges in the Qur'an. One is a challenge to the people of the book to bring their proofs, if they really want to get to the truth, to the bottom line. And on the other hand, they're also asked to bring a challenge against the Qur'an. They're asked to do so. So when they write against the Qur'an, when they speak against the Qur'an, they're doing what Allah told them. Now the question is, are we ready for their, their attacks or not? Their criticisms or not? But this is an invitation Allah Himself gave them. Bring a surah like it. If this was other than Allah, there would be lots of contradictions in it. Allah says this in the Qur'an. So they make websites about how there are contradictions in the Qur'an. Let them make it. It's good. Because the sincere among them who are actually making this effort, when they get to the truth, then this will be a, an undeniable proof for them. But we're the ones who have to clarify this proof. Proof. Finally, ayah number 112 for the day. بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ However, rather, on the contrary, not anyone just enters paradise, the one who submits his face before Allah. Allah didn't just even say that he's Muslim. Man kana Musliman. He says, Man aslama wajhahu lillahi. Who, who submitted his face to Allah. Now submitting the face to Allah, you know what that's an image of? It's an image of sajda. The imagery in the ayah is that of sajda. And what had happened among many branches of Al-Yahud and Nasara is, of the ibadat that they had abandoned was which one? They had, saj- they had abandoned sajda. They had abandoned sajda. Very few denominations among them still have sajda. They still do. Some Jesuits do. Some some clans of the the, the Christians in, in Israel, for example, have sajda. Some Orthodox branches of Judaism still have sajda. But the vast majority of them don't have sajda anymore. The first thing Allah calls them to is sajda. Balaman astama wajhahu lillahi. And obviously, when you say that, who's left in the immediate vicinity? Only the Muslims. The other thing here is face. The face in Arabic expression is is is. Uh, an image of pride. Your pride lies in your face. So for example, when you're humiliated, iswadda al-wujuh, the, the, the iswaddat al-wujuh, the faces became black. What that means is people were humiliated. Yasumunakum, they were blackening your faces, in Arabic implies for Bani Israel, that Fir'aun used to humiliate you. They used to blacken your faces. Now here Allah says, man aslama wajahu, who submitted their face also implies whoever submitted their ego, whoever submitted their pride, Whoever gave up their self-interest before Allah, that's a Muslim. That's the one who submitted themselves before Allah. Why was pride important to mention? Because that was the thing keeping them from coming to Islam. Because it was too too much an, you know a demand on their pride that they would accept an Arab as a messenger. So balamun aslama wajhahu lillah wa huwa muhsinun while he excels. In other words, the word muhsin here implying the messenger's definition sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu right? That you worship Allah as though you see Him. Acknowledging that the only way one can give up their pride is when they acknowledge all the time the presence of Allah. Because when you compare yourself to the greatness of Allah, obviously you'll bring your ego down. When you're not conscious of Allah, obviously your ego will get inflated. So who's the only one who'll be able to truly submit their face to Allah? Wa huwa muhsin, the one who reaches the state of ihsan. The one who excels. فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ Then he alone, he exclusively will have his reward, his compensation with his master. وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ And no fear will be upon them, nor will be the, they be the ones to grieve. The ayah went from singular to plural immediately. The first part was, you know, فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ He will have his reward with his master. Then he says, وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ This is a beautiful transition. In dunya, you may be alone in your efforts. You may be alone in coming to Islam. And of course, the Bani Israel, they're not gonna, they didn't come to Islam in groups. They came one by one. So they might stand alone. But when they come into the community of believers, they're not alone. They are plural. And their reward, on judgment day, the reward, by the way, is individual. كُلُّهُمْ عَيْتِهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدًا But when they, when we are, when we make it into paradise, we're together. فَلَهُمْ عَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ 
وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِ Here's it, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And he alludes at the end, and I'll conclude with that, وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ They won't be the ones to grieve. The whom here is used in Arabic, it's a principle called الْإِثْبَاتَ عَلَى غَيْرِ الْفَاعِلِ It's alluding to other than them grieving. In other words, Allah said it in a way that, uh, to say it in English would be, it won't be they that'll be grieving. In parentheses, it's like Allah is saying, but anyone other than them will in fact be grieving. They will be the ones to grieve. So Allah alluded to that, so they, in the end they get the point. Save yourself a lot of grief, and submit your face before Allah. May Allah make us of those who count among those who give their face, they submit their face before Allah, and their pride before Allah. And may Allah include all of us among the muhsineen. Marakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَى عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَى لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ فَاللَّهُ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم اما بعد we reached aya number 113 of surah al-baqarah before we appreciate fully <coughs> the the benefit of what Allah is saying in this ayah a quick reminder of what came in the ayah before بلا من اسلم وجهه لله وهو محسن Rather, whoever submitted their face to Allah, meaning their ego, their pride, their entire self to Allah, and they excelled in their deen, muhsin. Ihsan is the ultimate state where one is concerned with everything that they do for the sake of Allah. That's So you're most conscious of yourself. You're extremely conscious of yourself. That's the point I wanted to highlight before I talk about ayah number 113. Let's look at why. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ The Jews said that the Christians, the Nasara, they are based on nothing. They have no basis. They're deeply flawed. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودُ عَلَى شَيْءٍ And the, the Christians said the Jews have no basis. They're, they're in a flawed religion. وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ And it's ironic that they both are the ones that are reading the book. And what Allah is highlighting here is they're reading the same book, Al-Kitab. They're not two different books. Because what was given to Isa alayhi salam is a completion of what was given to Musa alayhi salam. Even in the Christian tradition, the Old and the New Testament, right? وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ Now the thing here is they're obsessed not with themselves but with somebody else. What is a muhsin supposed to be obsessed with? His own behavior in front of Allah. How they are, he or she ranks before Allah. But they are already very confident that they're okay with Allah. They don't need to be worried about that. When you're so clear that you yourself are saved, you yourself have already attained righteousness as high as it could go, then obviously your pursuit, your mental pursuit will not be about how, how to better yourself. You'll only be concerned with what to point out about others. So now they're obsessed with pointing out things about others. But in the previous ayah, Allah mentioned, no, you have to reach the state of ihsan. وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٍ فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ The other interesting thing here is, Allah didn't negate what they said. One group said, the Jews said, Christians are based on nothing, they have no basis. The Jews said, the Christians have no basis. And it's like Allah is agreeing, sure. You're both right. You know, he doesn't disagree with either one of them. وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ And yet it is they who read the book. Here's something else that Imam al-Alusi rahimahullah pointed out. Is that in this part of the ayah, it is they who read the book. In other words, they read the book only to find out who is not based on anything. They have no basis. So they're reading their book and trying to find evidence, proof, that the Christians are deviant. And the other is trying to find out evidence and proof that the Jews are deviant. And that's their entire religion. Their entire religion is just finding out proofs for who makes what deviant. Sound familiar? Right? When, when we reduce Islam to just this practice. Just saying, oh this group, they're based on nothing. That group, they're, they're based on nothing. And w- what's your proof? My, bo- my proof is here in the book. Look at this ayah. Because of this ayah, these people are deviant. Those people are deviant. These people are going to hell. Those people are going to hell. This is the exact... A- 
opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. And so this is, this practice is a practice of ignorance. So look at how the ayah ends. كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ This is just like the speech of those who knew nothing. They said things exactly like this. People that were totally ignorant said exactly similar kinds of things. It's interesting, Allah compares people who read the book. Now people who read the book are obviously knowledgeable. And in the same ayah, He's comparing them to people who have no knowledge. Obviously if they have no knowledge, it means they read no book. In other words, He's saying even though they read the book, they are still ignorant. They still don't have any knowledge. They don't have the knowledge they're supposed to have. And so He says, فَاللَّهُ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Then it is Allah, He will judge between them on judgment day. Another very important piece of the ayah. They're so obsessed with judging the other, not realizing that the judge in the end is Allah Azza wa Jal. And here just a subtlety that Muslims should also understand. We don't speak about the fate of the Christians or the Jews or the Hindus or the atheists. We know already very well, in dina in Allah al-Islam. Allah doesn't t- tell us to point fingers at the Jews and the Christians and things like that. What He tells us to point fingers at is shirk itself, kufr itself. Whoever does kufr, this will be their fate. You personally, I don't know how you're going to end up. I don't know what, you know, you might come to Islam later on, I don't know what exactly you believe, I'm not going to generalize. These are the principles in which we, on which we stand. In other words, Allah gave us knowledge by which we can judge actions, we can judge ideas, we can judge beliefs, but we still don't judge people. That judgment is reserved for Allah. That judgment even is reserved for Allah. So Allah says, Allah will be the one who judges between them. فَاللَّهُ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Allah will be the decisive judge between them on judgment day. فِيمَا كَانُوا فِيهِ يَخْتَلِفُونَ In all of the things they used to be disagreeing about. All of those disagreements will be resolved. All of them will be dealt with clearly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِنْ مَنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُهُ وَسَعَى فِي خَرَابِهَا أُولَئِكَ مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ أَنْ يَدْخُلُوهَا إِلَّا خَائِفِينَ لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا خِزْيٌ وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبُ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَاحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي فَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ وَمَنْ وَلَاهُ We spoke already about ayah number 113 where Allah spoke about the Jews and the Christians and them blaming or putting the fingers of blame on each other and Allah then saying كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ And this is the same kind of thing that people that have no knowledge say uh, just like them and so Allah will make a decision between them on judgment day فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون in whatever they used to disagree with each other in but now remember three groups were mentioned those three groups were the Jews, the Christians and then Allah didn't specify the third group He just said just like those who don't have knowledge they say this too so it was essentially three groups that were kind of alluded to, two explicitly and one implicitly. Kind of a description was given without a name to them, people without knowledge. Now one hint towards that is of course that the people that had, peop- that, that had books with them are considered people of knowledge, which is Jews, of, Jews and Christians. And the mushrikun of Mecca were not people of books, nor of reading and writing much. So they were considered the other, the, those who don't know. Which is why the word ummiyin is used for them also, the unlettered. الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who have no knowledge. So it's kind of alluding to the Makkans in that sense. But then that, that ishara, that, that pointing becomes explicit in the next ayah. And look how it's getting closer and closer to being explicit. Allah says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمْ Who could be a worse wrongdoer? مِمَّا مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ Than the one who forbade from the masajid of Allah, the, house, the, the houses of worship. By the way, masjid in Arabic, ism varf, is a place where sajda is done. Masjid and sajda have the same origin. So it's the place and a time of sajda actually. So masjid is the place where you do sajda, which is of course the masjid. And also the time at which you do sajda is also called masjid. Because an ism varf in Arabic is a place and a time. So min mana'a masajid Allah has two implications actually. One, the one who forbids people from entering or being able to utilize the houses of Allah, the masajid of Allah. So they could do sajda to Allah in those houses. And the second is actually they forbid people from specific times that they would have done sajda. And the most popular time to do sajda is the hajj. 
where the masses of people, the masjid is the fullest, especially the house of Allah, and the most sajda is done then. So it's alluding not just on the one hand to the act of sajda and the location of masajid, but even the hajj, the hajj itself. And why is this important? Because the Muslims have just been expelled from Mecca, and if they go back and try to make hajj, etc., it's very difficult, if not impossible for them to do so. Because they have enemies over there. So now Allah is alluding to that, saying, who could be a worse wrongdoer than the one who forbids from the masajid of Allah? But notice it's plural, masajid. Which means it includes not just al-masjid al-haram, which is the original masjid, but all masajid. So it's still in that sense a little bit more general. فَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنْعَى مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُهُ That his name should be mentioned in it. That his name should be mentioned in it. And here we learn by, by this kind of context, the fundamental purpose of the masjid. ذِكْرُ اسْمِ اللَّهِ you know, the, 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 the fundamental purpose of the masjid is to remember the name of Allah, to remember Allah. And this is talked about a, a few places in the Qur'an. You know, فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُهُ In homes in which Allah has given permission that His name should be mentioned, that He should be remembered. Right? So this idea, of, like salah is even the remembrance of Allah's name. It begins with even Allahu Akbar, you know, Al-Fatiha, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Mumtali, As-Salah Mumtali'a, Bismillah. You know, it's full of the name of Allah. Right, so this this idea of forbidding the remembrance of Allah and yudhkara fi hasmuhu wa saafi kharabiha, and who could be a worse wrongdoer that number one forbids people from you know masajid of Allah that his name be mentioned in it, and second he makes efforts in corrupting them. Not only does he stop people from coming to them, well, if he's stopping them from coming to them, he's in control of them, and what does he want to do? He makes efforts towards their corruption wa saafi kharabiha. Ulaika ma kana lahum. You know, the, 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 these people, there's nothing appropriate for them whatsoever. It is not becoming for them except, and yad khuluha illa khaifin, that they should enter it, they should enter the masajid, them, except in states of fear. These kinds of people, that all they deserve is that they should be the ones entering the masjids in a state of fear. Why? Because actually in the context of the seerah, they inflicted fear, they induced fear onto the believers from entering the houses of Allah. And Allah is saying it should be the other way around. They should be the ones afraid to enter the house of Allah. Because of the crimes they've committed against His houses. لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا خِزْيُونَ For them in this world, there is humiliation. So Allah is already alluding to the fact that the people who have done that, in the Sirah's case, the Quraysh, even in dunya, humiliation is about to come for them. So it's kind of a clue towards the Fath of Mecca. وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And in the Akhirah they have enormous or great punishment also. Especially for them. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّا مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ This is early Madani surah, like I mentioned, most of this surah is early Madani. And in this time, of course, the Jews and Christians, the Muslims are coming into contact with the Jewish and the Christian community. The focus, of course, in Baqarah is the Jewish community. The focus in Ali Imran will be the Christian community. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget that there's a third party which the Messenger ﷺ was first in contact with who still have their animosity towards Allah's Messenger, those are the Quraysh. So now you've got three groups of people, the, the Jews, the Christians, and the Mushrikun. Now Allah reminds us of the, those two groups, but He also takes us back to the third group, which is the Mushrikun. And He says about them, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمْ Who could be more of a wrongdoer? مِمَّا مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ Than the one who forbade the Masajid of Allah, meaning forbade people from going to the houses of Allah. مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أن يذكر في هسمه وسعافي خرابها that Allah's name should be mentioned in them and they made efforts to corrupt them. Now Allah didn't just specifically talk, even though most mufassirun say these ayat are hinting towards the Kaaba and the mushrikun stopping the Muslims from coming to the Kaaba and then putting idols in there, therefore causing corruption in them. But Allah interestingly in the ayah didn't say Masjid Allah, He said Masajid Allah. What's Masajid? Plural. It's mas- all Masjids. Allah is saying, who could be a worse person than the one who forbids people from going to the houses of Allah? Forbids the masajid of Allah. And interestingly, the, the maf'ul bihi is not mentioned. Forbids who? Allah doesn't say, mana'an nasa. An yadhabu, an yazuru masajid Allah. He forbids people from going to the masjids of Allah. The phrase literally says, forbids the masjid of Allah. What that implies is it forbids people from going to the masjid. What that also implies it is that the person forbids the masjid from doing what it's supposed to do. The masjid has certain functions. It's supposed to be able to do certain things. And this person makes sure that the masjid does not get to do those things. It's as though Allah is saying the masjid itself wants to do an act. 
and this person is forbidding that act, right? Now, what are the the, the acts that this person forbids? An yudhkara fi hasmuhu that his name should be mentioned in them. His name, Allah's name, should be mentioned in the masjid. And this, you know, dhikru, you know, ism rabbik, ism rabbina, this mention of Allah's name, or the name of our master, some sahaba interpreted this to mean the Qur'an itself. Because the best way to remember the name of Allah, sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la, fasabbih bismi rabbika al-azim, these are, this is Qur'an. So they stop Qur'an from being taught. Stop Qur'an from being recited. Others believe this to mean that the houses of worship in the Christian and the Jewish communities were originally masajid. And then Allah's tawheed was refused in those masajid. It was stopped. So then Allah says that Allah's name was not allowed to be mentioned. And then the other thing is there is a sect among the Christians and there's also a major population within the Jews who talk about God as someone who shall not be named. God shall not, he who shall not be named, right? And they speak about how his name is so holy and so sanctified, you can't even call him by his name. And so Allah says, who could be a worse wrongdoer than someone who refuses to call, allow for Allah's name to be mentioned to remember? So Allah is basically alluding to the fact that this is one of the tricks of shaitan. You take away the, you know, فَأَنْسَاهُمْ ذِكْرَ اللَّهِ Like the Qur'an tells us. Shaitan, إِسْتَهْوَذَ عَلَيْهِمُ الشَّيْطَانِ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ ذِكْرَ اللَّهِ Shaitan basically wrapped them around their, his finger and made them forget the remembrance of Allah. So to convince them that Allah's name is so awesome, you shouldn't even say it. What an amazing trick. So, you know, أُولَٰئِكَ مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ أَن يَدْخُلُوهَا إِلَّا خَائِفِينَ These people, they deserve nothing else. Except that when they enter the masajid, they should enter in a state of fear. This has been again interpreted in multiple ways. One of them is that those masajid, they were supposed to be masajid, but now there's no mention of Allah in them. Instead of becoming a place of peace, those places become a place of terror and fear. What's interesting in Christian tradition, if you look at the architecture in Christian tradition, right? They, they, they stain their windows. You notice that in the Catholic tradition specifically? They keep light from coming inside. And they specifically design windows in a way that the only light that comes in is the one that st- shines on the statue of Mary or the statue of Jesus. So you feel like you're in the dark and the only light is over there. That's kind of the, 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 uh, design structure of, you know, the Christian, uh, the, the church, tra- the old church tradition. A lot of churches, even today, there's no windows. Like uh, some sects, sects actually, they, they don't allow for the windows. Like Jehovah's Witness, if you notice the, one of their temples, you won't see any windows there. But what's really interesting is, one of the first things you'll notice, especially in classical church architecture, is it's terrifying. It's very dark, and dark stone, and large towers, and, you know, dark corners, dark, you know, there's, there's not enough light inside. So this is one thing that it may be alluding to. The other thing, the, the, the ulama that believe this ayah is talking about the mushrikun who stop people from entering the house of Allah. Allah is saying, no, they have terrified the believers. What they deserve is, they sh- they're the ones who shouldn't be allowed to enter the Kaaba. And if they do ever enter, they should be terrified. أُولَٰئِكَ مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ أَنْ يَدْخُلُوهَا إِلَّا خَائِفِينَ In other words, the table should completely be turned. What Allah is alluding to here is, right now the Makkans are in charge of the Kaaba, but a time is coming where instead of the believers being afraid to go to Mecca, it will be the kuffar that will be afraid to go to Mecca. And so Allah says, مَا كَانَ لَهُمْ أَنْ يَدْخُلُوهَا إِلَّا خَائِفِينَ It is not becoming of them at all to enter it except in a state of fear. لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا خِزْيٌ For these people in this, in this dunya, in the world, is, all, is, is humiliation, especially for them. So Allah guarantees in this ayah, for example, the humiliation of the mushrikun. It hasn't even happened yet. This is early Medina. They haven't been humiliated yet. This is actually, many even consider this, these ayat before the battle of Badr. So there's no physical humiliation even happening to the mushrikun yet. But Allah guarantees it already. لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا خِزْيٌ وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And in the akhirah they will have enormous, intense, great punishment. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. ولله المشرق والمغرب and to Allah alone the east and the west belong. Allah says to Allah alone the east and the west belong. This is important because the ayat that are coming will will help us understand why this clue is being dropped now. You know the Muslims have moved from one place to another, and. You know, they might feel bad that they left the house of Allah, they left the house that Ibrahim alayhi salam built, and now they're all the way in Medina. But Allah is saying, actually, that land belongs to Allah, but then again, both the east and the west belong to Allah. All of, you're still in service to Allah. And the masajid of Allah, because 
the, both the east and west belong to Allah, you should be establishing masajid wherever you may be because it's only to Allah that, the, that all of the east and all of the west belong. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَأَيْنَمَا تُوَلُّوا Then wherever you may turn, فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ Then there you find the face of Allah. There you find the face of Allah. In other words, there's no turning away from Allah. Allah is you know, looking towards His pleasure. This, by the way, the other thing. وَجْهُ اللَّهِ even implies مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ The pleasure of Allah. It's a figure of speech. Right? So wherever you may turn, you'll find the face of Allah. Or the direction really of Allah. Or the pleasure of Allah. You know why this is important? Because a few ayat later, we're going to start reading the ayat of the change of the qibla. The change of the qibla. And the Muslims have been facing a certain way to make salah towards Aqsa. But once the change occurs, they're going to be praying towards Mecca. And this big change, they're already being prepared for it even before the ayat have come. Because Allah says, wherever you turn, the direction itself is not the fundamental thing. The fundamental thing is that you will be with good intent facing or heading, you know, intending towards Allah. فَثَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ and then he says, "Well, in Allah wasi'un alim. Certainly, Allah is encompassing, wasi', and all, all knowledgeable, wasi'un alim. So He encompasses the lands. He encompasses our intentions. So don't restrict Allah to one house. And also, that's interesting that Allah said masajid, plural, because now we're gonna go from the direction of one masjid to another masjid as the ayat continue, inshallah ta'ala. Wa qalu Allahu waladan subhanahu. Now look." In this ayah, when they forbade the masajid of Allah, forbade from the masajid of Allah, of course that's alluding to the Quraysh. Now look at the next ayah. Allah says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا They said Allah has taken a son. Who's this talking about? It's actually talking about the Jews and the Christians. وَقَالَتُ الْيَهُودُ عُزَيْنٌ ibn Allah. They're included too. And of course, what, what the Christians say is known. So both those groups are allude, you know, referred to. So all three groups come up again. They were mentioned in summary form in the first ayah of this passage, and now they're coming up again. So Allah says, you know, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا سُبْحَانَهُ He's far too perfect and above that claim. سُبْحَانَهُ To declare, it comes from, you know, tasbih. سَبَّحَ يُسَبِّهُ And سَبَّحَ in Arabic is swimming or floating. The idea of subhanAllah... When we say subhanAllah, you know what that means? It means there's a status we have declared for Allah, the status of perfection. And that remains, that floats where it is. It remains perfect. To bring it down, anything below that would be to try to make it drown, to bring it down from where it belongs, deserves to be. So whenever some, someone says something inappropriate about Allah, about Allah, the thing to say is subhanahu, no, he's above that. He remains perfect. So that, that's how we understand that phrase, subhanahu. So this hideous claim is being made by certain groups. اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا That Allah took a son. So Allah says, He's above and beyond that. He's too perfect for that. That's the expression, subhanahu. But لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Rather, it is only to Him that the entire heavens and the earth belong. And this belonging is important too. Because what happens in these theologies where Allah is given, or God is given children, that the dominions of the skies and the earth are shared. You know? So for example, it, it began with, out of His love, the Lord sent His Son, Jesus Christ, all of that. Then what happens slowly? It transitions. Their aqidah, they change. Their aqa, it changed. And they transition into Jesus being Lord. Right? Then they'll say Jesus is Lord. Then they'll say, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the kingdom of Jesus, etc., etc. In other words, they'll keep taking further and further steps and start giving Isa alayhi salam mulk. Start attributing mulk to him. And so this problem is being solved here. So Allah says, بَلَّهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ No, he, he uh, possesses the dominion and the ownership of the skies and the earth. كُلٌّ لَهُ قَانِتُونَ all, everything is subservient to him. Everything is subservient to him. And someone might counter-argue, no, not everything is subservient to him. The kuffar are not subservient to him. The munafiq is not subservient to Allah, in submission to Allah. How can Allah say, kullun lahu qanitun? First of all, the, the, the siyaq of the ayah, as samawat wal ard, the skies and the earth. In other words, it's referring to things other than human beings. All of creation around you is submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the other thing also is, uh, even if it included human beings, even the kafir, his heart, his veins, his brain, 
his muscles, their fun- the functioning of his eyes, the ability of, of him to hear. These abilities also submit to Allah, whether he misuses them or not. The, the functions we have, like the ability to breathe, his lungs have submitted to Allah. He commands them to breathe and they breathe. And he commands them to stop breathing and they stop breathing. So in that sense, كُلٌّ لَهُ قَانِتُونَ وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا Now the Christian community, and they said Allah has taken a son, subhanahu, he is far above that. You know, people who have done shirk, have done shirk in the house of Allah by putting idols there. But that's not the only form of shirk. Shirk can be without an idol in front of you too. There's this like most raw, ugly, explicit form of shirk of idols in front of you. But there are other forms of shirk too. So when one is mentioned, immediately the other is mentioned that this community didn't think that they're doing shirk. When, they, when the Arab Christians heard of mushrikun, they thought of somebody else. They thought of the pagans in Arabia. They worship idols. They, they're committing a crime of blasphemy against Allah, of shirk. Allah says, actually, no, those who say Allah has taken a son also. And they said Allah has taken a son. Subhanahu. He's far above that. He's too perfect for that. Subhanahu is a, a statement in the Quran used often when a, something inappropriate is said about Allah and Allah says that in response. So Subhanahu, we say Subhanallah, is actually to say you're saying something inappropriate about Allah and Allah is way above what you're saying. Allah is way too perfect for that kind of talk. That's what Allah uses the word. Subhan, like Subhanahu wa Taala, Amma yaqulun alu wa kabira. How how far above? How too perfect he is above what they're saying about him. Okay. So now, Ballahu ma fi samawati wal ard. No, he only he exclusively owns whatever is in the skies and the earth. Kullu lahu qanitun. Everything. Kullu. Kullu usually comes as a mudaf, meaning something's after it. But when kullun comes by itself, it becomes everything altogether. There are so many things that you can't even put a mudafile there. You can't even put something else after it. It's everything, all of it in existence, is in complete subservience exclusively to him. Qanitun. Qudut means you're humble before your master. You know, it's one thing to be obedient to a master, it's another to be qanit, subservient to a master. Let me tell you the difference. There's two slaves. There's a qanit slave, and there's a muti' slave, an obedient slave. The master says to both of them, go get me water. One of them says, okay, and he gets up and goes. And the other one goes, yes sir, right now, immediately. He runs, and he runs back. He's so willing to obey immediately. He's constantly ready on, the, on, you know, on standby to obey. Can't wait to make the master happy. This is qanit. It's a step above. Obeying someone doesn't mean that you're qanit. Allah says, everything in the skies and the earth is qanit. It's ready and willing immediately to obey Allah. كُلُّ اللَّهُ قَانِتُونَ بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ He is the initiator. In philosophy they say, uh, creation ex nihilo, which means creation out of nothing. Creation out of nothing. Because creation could be, you took wood and created a table, right? But badi' means create something out of nothing. Innovate something entirely new, with no previous ingredients. So بَدِيعُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ the initiator, the, the, the original creator of the skies and the earth, إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا Whenever he would declare a matter, فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ Then it, it's only for him to say, be, this issue the command of existence, be, come to exist, that's كُنْ فَيَكُونَ Then it exists, then it comes into existence. And this is important to say every time the theology, especially of the Christian communities mentioned in the Qur'an, you will find usually kun fayakun comes up. With Isa alayhi salam especially, kun fayakun comes up. Why? Because this idea of him being the son, Allah is explaining, yes, it defied the natural order that you're used to, mother and father begetting a child. Why this theology even developed is because he's born, born of a virgin mother. So they had to figure out a father somehow. So that's, that's the idea of, you know, attributing fatherhood to Allah Azza wa Jal. But he says, no, this is a matter of kun fayakun. So kun fayakun in Arabic, in the Quran especially, is used when things happen out of what you expect nature to do. For miraculous things, for things that defy the norm. This is the, the, the kun of Allah, this is kalimat kun. You know, uh, my teacher used to say about this kalima, that you know, when, when a teacher gives a dars or a reminder or advice, or somebody gives you good counsel, things like that, or you're listening to a khutbah, the words are coming out of the speaker's mouth and they're going into your ear, but they haven't entered your heart yet. 
And it could be, he could be speaking to you, the imam could be speaking to you for 10 years. And nothing, and everything entered the ear, but none of it entered the heart. And one day Allah decided to say kun to one of his words. To one of his words. And then the, that word went from the ear all the way to the heart. But that getting into the heart, the word entering and penetrating the heart and having that effect, that's actually from the, the command of Allah. It's a miraculous thing when light meets light. That, that's from the amr of Allah. Right? It's a beautiful thing. So, إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ So now in this passage, even though I'm not finished with the passage, inshallah, we'll do it um, tomorrow, uh, we have a uh, summarized discussion of three groups. And all three groups are important in this surah. The, even though this surah is, is madani, these three groups are critical to understand and their relationships are important to understand in understanding Surah Al-Baqarah. And as the ayat go further, you'll start to see that. Why that's important that we keep these three groups in mind in our development of understanding in this surah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Badi'u samawati wal ard. The initiator. Badi'u. You probably heard the word bid'a not in some nice settings before. But the word badi'ah comes from that. It means to initiate something from nothing. In philosophy, they say creation ex nihilo, right? From creation out of nothing, out of zilch. He is the creator out of nothing of the skies and the earth. Badi'ah samawati wal ard. Al khalq yaktalif. The word khalq is different. Khalq is you create something. It can even be create something out of something else. Like Allah created the human being from clay. Khalqtahu min tinin. But he says the entire existence, he didn't need something to create it, he created it out of nothing, that's the word badi'ah. Badi'u samawati wal ardi. Wa idha qada amran fa innama yaqulu lahu kun fayakud. And whenever he decides a matter, whenever, whenever it may be that he makes the decision for anything, then all he does, innama yaqulu lahu, he says to it, kun bi. He says a word, bi. Kun. Come into existence. Kun. فَيَكُونُ Then it becomes. It happens. He makes this statement right after he talks about the Christians who think they're not doing shirk. But when they say he has a son, you know, Allah is teaching them, Allah the one who created the entire universe out of nothing can't create a man without a father? The one who created as-samawati wal ard out of nothing. He can't just say kun and create a, you know, a child in the womb of Maryam? Why do you have to go as far as to make shirk? And say that he fathered. Why do you have to go that far? So this is Allah correcting their theology. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And then Allah makes reference to those who don't know. In other words, the mushrikun again is going back to what one of the last things, even though this is a madani surah, what were some of the most you know, constant criticisms of the mushrikun of Makkah? What did they use to constantly reject Islam? One of the last things that they used to reiterate all the time before migration. Basically, they said, "Lawla yukallimun Allah. How come Allah doesn't talk to us? How come He chose you? What's so special about you anyway? Your parents are dead. You're an orphan. You're not even that wealthy. You're not even a tribe leader. Why would He pick you? You know, Lawla unzira hadal Quran ala rajul min al qariyatayni azim. How come this Quran didn't come down to one of the two celebrities from town? Or some, you had some pretty great leaders in town." People already listen to them. them, they have so much influence already. If they had become messengers, it would have been so much easier for us to accept them as messengers. How come an orphan? Doesn't make any sense. Why, why, you, why could God get talk to us? Why does He only talk to you? لَوْ لَا يُكَلِّمُنَ Allah. How come Allah doesn't talk to us? أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً Or how come He doesn't send us any revelations? Why will He only come to you? Why does the angel only pick you? أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً this is, you know, um, not too long ago, I don't recommend you guys watch this documentary, but not too long ago I saw bits and pieces of Religulus. You know, the, the documentary basically poking fun at religion. Essentially, the purpose of the documentary was to poke fun at the idea of prophets, essentially. What's so special about that? Why does God choose to talk to them? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense to me. Allah says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who have no idea, they say, they talk like this. They talk like this back then, they still talk like this now. There's no change. There's really no change. 
It's why these arguments, Allah recorded them, not just because the mushrikun were making them, because these will be timeless arguments. People will be using them all the time. Uh, this is guidance for all time. And so people think they're so smart, they came up with some new criticism that they should make a documentary about. A Bedouin Arab made these arguments already. Back in the desert. Okay? Um, an idol-worshipping pagan made these arguments already. This is nothing new. لَوْلَا يُكَلِّمُنَ اللَّهُ أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ And they think they're the ones that just came up with it. Allah says, you're not even new. كَذَلِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ That is exactly what those who came much before them said, just like their words. They said exactly that. <laughs> they think they came up with something. Allah says, not, not even you. There's been fools before who said the same exact thing. This is old. تَشَابَهَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ not only are their words similar, their hearts ha- are very similar. Their hearts have the same exact kind of disease. Tashabahat qulub Across generations, people have the same exact disease. This is one of the great features of the Qur'an. Allah talks about people living in different societies, different centuries, different times, different worlds almost. And yet they say exactly the same thing. We're going to find this for evildoers, but also for good doers. We're going to find in Surah Al-Shu'ara, different prophets talking. Salih is talking, Hud is talking, Lut is talking, Nuh is talking. These prophets never even talk to each other, isn't that true? They never even talk to each other. But yet, when they talk to their people, Allah will quote the same exact ayah over and over and over again. And you'll sit there wondering, why is Allah repeating Himself? He's telling you something. Man, this happened a hundred years 500 years, a thousand years apart, and yet the same exact conversation happened. What an amazing training that Allah gives His prophets that they all deliver consistently exactly the same message. Quality control. The franchise of prophethood. The franchise. It doesn't change, it doesn't budge. Same exact message every time. And the people of diseases, shaitan, also got a franchise. It's the same shaitan making the same waswasa, whether he's making it to a guy riding a horse, or a guy riding a Ferrari with a horse logo on it, it doesn't make a difference. It's the waswasa is the same. Names will change, times will change, generations will change, but the waswasa will be the same. Tashabahat qulubuhum. Then Allah says, قَدْ بَيَّنَّ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يُقِينُونَ It's beautiful. We have made our ayat absolutely clear. Abundantly clear. قَدْ We've already done it. You know, they said, how come no ayah comes to us? If it comes to us, we'll be convinced. How come God doesn't talk to us? لَوْلَا يُكَلِّمُنَ Allah. How come? God doesn't talk to us. Allah doesn't talk to us. If He, if he did, I'd say, okay, yeah, made, makes sense. I see it now. Allah says, no. I don't have to convince you based on your requests. I've already sent something that is convincing enough. And who, who thinks it's convincing enough? Allah Himself does. This is a really important thing for Muslims to internalize. We're not here to impress anyone. Allah has already, Allah has already told us that His word is impressive enough. We're just here to clarify it. You know, a lot of times da'is think like they're making a sale. They have to impress the customer so he can buy the product. Right? In, in Punjabi they say, thalle lagna. That's <laughs> an expression in Punjabi. Basically, you, you accept the the superiority of the client, and you do whatever is you can to make the sale. And when a client is des- when a salesman is desperate, you know what it's spe- what it talks what it's saying in between the lines. It's talking about the low quality. It's telling about it's, it's telling indicating the low quality of the product. If the product is quality in and of itself, the salesman is not desperate at all. Why not? Because he believes in the product. The product speaks for itself. I don't have to convince you that it's awesome. I don't have to tell you what other customers have said. I don't have to give you a test drive. I don't have to do anything. It is what it is. Take it or leave it. And th- th- you know, you'll find in the world products that are quality. They don't even have to go out of their way to sell them to you. You go and line up outside the store before it opens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. You know, the, you know, the Christians say the apple was forbidden, right? <laughs> we don't say that. <laughs> but the, I'm just kidding. But the point I'm trying to make is, Allah says Himself, 
بَيَّنَ الْآيَاتِ We've already made the ayat clear. I don't need to convince you according to your conditions. You, who are you? I've already said, sent what is enough. But for who? لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ For a nation that actually wants to be convinced. Now this is a grammatical principle. Usually you have a noun and an adjective. If it was a noun and adjective situation, the Arabic would have been لِقَوْمٍ مُقِنِينَ for a convinced nation, a nation that is convinced. Allah says, لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ The adjective is actually a verb. This is not something I, I teach early on, but the adjective is actually a verb. And what this does in Arabic is, it changes the meaning not just to a quality, like a believing nation, but a nation that wants to believe. In this case, a convinced nation? No. That would have been لِقَوْمٍ مُقِنِينَ لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ means a nation that wants to be convinced. If you are really looking to be convinced, then the ayat are enough. What Allah is telling us here is the fact that you're saying this is not because you're, you want to be convinced. You just want to make small talk, and you want to come up with things to say to, to be able to justify that you're not going to believe. You are not looking to be convinced. You've already convinced yourself, as a matter of fact, that you will not be believing. That's when you're talking like this. If you were looking to be convinced, the ayat were enough. That's the argument. It's really powerful. قَدْ بَيَّنَ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يُقِنُونَ And he started by saying, you know, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who have no knowledge talk like this. No knowledge of what the question is. No knowledge of what the actual revelation is. How come God doesn't do this, that, the other? Have you read the book? No, why would I bother reading the book? I don't know what the book says. I'm just going to come up with my own demands of what God should be doing to impress me. I've met so many people like that. How come God doesn't, you know, just give me a sign? Doesn't teach me something? Why do I have to come to Him? Who are you and who is He? Who should come to who? Who should be meeting whose demands? You know? This is the qawm and yuqinun, captured very powerfully in this ayah. Then the Prophet is told, what, look, Allah establishes, He doesn't have to come down to the slave and meet His demands. He's already met exactly what the human being needs. He sent revelation. And then he tells the Prophet, you shouldn't be desperate either. Because the one delivering the message is not Allah Himself. The one delivering the message is the Messenger. So the Messenger has to have a certain kind of attitude too. He shouldn't fall into becoming desperate for people. And the Messenger is not desperate because he doesn't believe in the product. He's desperate because he's worried about people. They're going to go to hell if they don't listen. He's genuinely concerned. <clears throat> so Allah says to him, إِنَّا بِالْحَقِّ We have sent you with truth. Don't worry about what they say. We have, I'm telling you what you have is the truth. We have sent you with a mission with truth. Bashiran wa nadiran. And you fulfill two roles. You only give good news and you give warnings. You don't plead. You don't do anything else. You've got two things to do. Those who believe, give them good news. Those who don't believe, give them a warning. And on top of, and then the Prophet is worried, what about the people of, that are going to end up in hellfire? And Allah says, وَلَا تُسْأَلُ عَنْ أَصْحَابِ الْجَحِيمِ you will not be asked about the people of hell. You will not. Jahim, uh, Jaham actually is the stare of a lion. You know, when a lion stares, it's prey, right before it devours it. That's the quality given to hellfire. It stares its victims down, and then it pounces on them. <clears throat> You're not going to be asked about the people of Al Jahim. <clears throat>